Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Chaitan Bhatt, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Human Rights at LSE, and I'd like to warmly welcome you to this special event for a special person on United Nations International Human Rights Day. And this is, of course, an event to, to honor and to celebrate the wonderfully rich life and work of our very dear friend and colleague, Stan Cohen. As I think many of you know, Stan was one of the founders for the Center for the Study of Human Rights, and he was a key figure in shaping the, and guiding the center over many years, since its inception in 2000. And this was through his wisdom, as well as his very sharp wit, and of course his intellect, and especially his human warmth, which all of us felt. And on behalf of the center, and the Department of Sociology, and the LSE, I would like to thank you very much indeed for being here with us and sharing this special evening with us. I'd also like to thank my colleague Margot Pickin. Margot was a very close friend of Stan's and is a visiting fellow, very closely associated with the center, and she'll be chairing this event. And I'd also like to thank the wonderful people who are here tonight who will be talking about various facets of Stan's life and his work. And I especially want to thank Stan's family and his friends and colleagues and former students, many of whom I know have traveled very far to be with us this evening. So thank you and welcome. Mark. Thank you very much, Chetan. Um, and uh, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, as Chetan said, this year um, the Centre is dedicating Human Rights Day to the life and celebration of our friend and colleague Stan Cohen. Our speakers this evening will be talking to you about Stan's significance for criminology, sociology and human rights. And I simply want to uh, repeat what Chetan has just said, and that was that, that is that, that Stan really was the driving force behind setting up the centre here at LSE and also the, the Masters in Human Rights, together with uh, other colleagues um, at the school, some of whom are, are here this evening. Um, we've got a very full programme tonight. Um, after our speakers, uh, I will be inviting contributions from the floor. And uh, after that, we will uh, end um, the program with an aria uh, from one of Stan's uh, favorite operas. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, you have actually quite a lot, you have information about them in your programs. So I'm going to be brief and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, Robin Cohen um, is Stan's younger brother. Stan and Robin uh, were born in Johannesburg. Uh, they went to the same high school together. They went to the same university together. They even did a master's at LSE. I'm not sure whether you did it together or separately. <laughs> um, and then their paths diverged uh, with Robin spending uh, significant amounts of time in Nigeria and Trinidad. Um, and then returning to South Africa uh, at the end of apartheid, uh, where he was at the University of Cape Town and uh, the Dean of Humanities there. David Downs is an emeritus professor of social policy at LSE. David supervised Stan's doctoral uh, dissertation on, on vandalism, and, uh, and later worked with Stan and others in founding the National Deviancy Conference and teaching the masters in crime, deviance and control. David and Stan were lifelong friends and colleagues. Daphne Golan, welcome, uh, teaches human rights at, uh, at uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. 
She was the founding research director of the, of the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem, and she and Stan wrote the first Israeli report on the torture of Palestinian detainees, which B'Tselem published in 1991. Thomas Hammerberg, until recently, was the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, Thomas and Stan met in the mid-1990s when discussions were underway about setting up an international council on human rights policy. Uh, uh, Stan became a, an active and, and devoted member of the council and Stan and Thomas uh, developed a, a, a lasting and deep friendship. Harvey Mullich uh, is Professor of Sociology and Metropolitan Studies at New York University, and he was Stan's colleague and very dear friend at Essex University, the University of California, Santa Barbara, and LSE. Uh, Harvey's most recent book, which I'm going to quote because it very much, very much evokes the spirit of Stan, I have to say, uh, is called Against Security, How We Go Wrong at Airports, Subways and Other Sites of Ambiguous Danger. And, uh, Stan's, and, and Harvey says this, the book owes much to Stan's inspiration. So thank you very much to you all for, for coming. And, uh, and I'll hand over to you, Robin. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. We've got a very busy program, and I've been warned we have to be quick, so keep up. We'll go through these slides rather quickly. So it's called Roots and Roots, and it's a prequel to Stan's journey. Um, it tells us a little bit about his family history and about what may have influenced some of his ideas. So I'm the kind of warm-up warm -up act um, before we, you'll get the real stuff a little later on. Well, this story begins in a little village uh, in Lithuania. It's called Vekshna. It's just near the Latvian border. And if you uh, work your way along the left in the smaller picture, you'll see the Baltic Sea. Uh, sea that played quite a big role in the uh, departure of our family. There, the founding father, um, Ruben Lieber Cohen, his wife, Chaya, who died 19. 41, a, day of, a year of some significance, as we'll see, and their two grandchildren, the children of a woman called Gita. It wasn't a great place to grow up in, and as you'll see, uh, that was uh, a, a rainy, rainy day in Vekshna. What were they doing there? Like many other uh, Jews, they're about half the population of this little village, they were shopkeepers. And one of the shops was a little haberdashery where um, three shops in the village, one of whom was owned by Reuben, he couldn't have made much money as there were only about 3,000 people in this village. So he had about one customer every three years. Well, 41 I mentioned, and that's the bad time because the German army invaded. They didn't do very much other than say to the Lithuanian authorities and the respectable folk, around do what you like with the Jews. So they proceeded to do just that, forcing, in this case, the villagers to dig a mass grave. And um, they all perished except uh, one uh, who got on a bicycle, pedaled like hell, managed to get to Russia and uh, escaped to tell the tale. Um, as you see, the Lithuanian jury didn't do too well um, just about 10% or so of them survived. That's the grave where they were all buried, uh, 4,000 people. And fortunately, some people got out before this all happened. And they left via Lipia, Latvia, along the Baltic, down the Kiel Canal to Britain, 
where some of them stayed, some of them went on to further afield, and some of them went to South Africa. And you'll see there uh, the castle line, well known to South Africans, advertised for uh, immigrants to join in Yiddish, but with Hebrew writing. So that was the little attempt to try and recruit the immigrant. And that was their first generation. Top of the, these were Reuben and Chaya's kids. Joseph, another story, he won't spend too much time on him. He was the stray, he went first to the United States and was caught up in difficult circumstances there. Gita, the one two down, uh, was the wife of those two little kiddies, her husband, her, and the mum, all were in that mass grave. But the others escaped to South Africa, or had already left. And you'll notice something interesting happening. They begin to slightly anglicize themselves. So Meisha becomes Morris, Hirsch becomes Harry, Max uh, sort of sufficiently anglicized to stick with Max, so is Frida, and Shia, who's underlined there, our father, Sai, um, is uh, goes to South Africa, he's the youngest, and there he stands, age 22, with his first Hudson car. I actually found one on the internet uh, for 50,000 US, uh, that very car um, in exactly that model. I don't think this was in necessarily in prime condition because there was some talk of the wheel coming off in some remote place in, near Amatakulu. Well, everything looked okay, except as the war, cloud, uh, war began to loom, some of the locals, who subsequently became rather powerful figures politically, and we include uh, subsequent Prime Minister B.J. Forster there down on the left, a man called Oswald Piro, who was actually German, German-speaking, spoke German at his dinner table, and was welcomed in Berlin by the Nazis, and a particularly sinister outfit called the Osava Brandtwach, the Oxwagon Sentinel, began to make noises rather like, oh, don't we have too many Jews around in South Africa? So this was a tough period, an anxious-making period, as the war um, proceeded, and the Jews suddenly felt a little uneasy again. Could this all happen again? And of course they had heard by 1941 of what had happened to the, the remaining people in uh, Lithuania. Good times returned, particularly after the war, and there you see the three brothers um, beginning to enjoy the fruits of um, some degree of prosperity and some degree of security, and beginning to adopt somewhat anglicised, or in one case, that of my father, Scottish ways. And there's the next generation, our generation. By this time, 17 people, and they're beginning to move much more to other countries. You'll see there Australia, Lithuania, the one left in Lithuania I already mentioned, South Africa, Israel, US, Canada, and Australia. And, and they didn't, of course, just move once, but several times. Stan, for example, spent some time in Israel, as uh, you'll hear. And one of our cousins, Hazel, I think managed the record, was it five times or six, that she went backwards and forwards from South Africa to Israel and back again, and now she's in the United States. I think she was given a discount for, by Pickford, or perhaps she should have been anyway. And that's us. Those are the little kiddies. Um, in complete innocence, six, four, and two, in the year in which the nationalist government was um, elected. And, of course, we didn't really know what was going on. We lived in that little bubble world of white South Africa for the most part, and within that little bubble world there was another little bubble world, which was that little suburb which was predominantly um, Jewish. And I went down to the um, primary school just a few days ago. I've just been in South Africa to uh, sort of reconnect, and that school, I think, was about 60 or 70 percent Jewish, and it's now 95 percent black, which was quite an interesting transformation. And I'll just linger a little bit on this last slide, uh, and just to say, well, what does this all, in a sense, amount to? 
And this is really to try and provide some kind of sense of, of introduction to the speakers who are much more professionally qualified than I am to talk about Stan's work. Well, I think these are, I would say, precognitions in the sense that they were intimations or sensibilities that drew from this family's history and from our early life. That we were a family in motion, we were moving, it was difficult to put down roots. Where we put down roots, they were often shallow. It became um, a sense in which, oh, so-and-so, our first cousin, she's in Canada now. Oh, in Canada? I thought she was in the United States. And then one wasn't quite entirely sure. Of course, the next generation has become a little bit more deeply rooted. There was nowhere to go back. Lithuania was anathema. We still can't bring ourselves to do it. Uh, my cousin Gary in the audience, we often talk about, shall we go back to Lithuania? And then we decide, no, we can't quite face it. It, it was horrible. And, of course, the Lithuanian government has never really faced up in the same way as the German government has to this monstrous act that they had committed. Um, for him, and I think for us, but particularly for Stan, Place and space were somehow liquid. He didn't invest a great deal in artifacts, in furniture, in homes, in permanent residences. He tended to have his books and his pictures and his photos, some of them a bit dog-eared, um, that went with him from office to office, from place to place. And I think this gave him a sense... Uh, not perhaps that he was rootless, but that he had some sensibility of people who were also out of place in some way. Um, so this didn't mean that you had to be some dramatic, you know, uh, thing had happened to you, but maybe just a student who ended up at LSE and it wasn't really that much like Kansas, and he would find in Stan somebody he could talk to and relate to. And I think Stan was very sensitive to those kinds of uh, sentiments. The second precognition is that he was very wary of states or any states. Obviously, the Russian state, uh, at some point helping, at some point hindering a refuge for some Lithuanian uh, Jews, but sometimes also a place uh, where oppression started. We don't have to say anything about the Nazis, less said, better. Lithuania, I've already talked about. And South Africa, that curious blend of privilege in which we were... We profited from being, in a sense, uh, joining the white race, um, becoming part of that uh, ax, uh, that 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 that, uh, that sense of being important or self-important or more important than we really were. We were getting decent educations, some degree of affluence, and some degree of 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 of, of security amidst a high level of social injustice that was all around us. And, of course, as we were adolescents, we became more and more aware of it, and so too did Stan. Stan clung for a long time, much longer than I did, I have to say, to the idea that um, there could be some kind of secular, socialist, reforming, messianic, uh, new kind of Israel that was something to do with the original founders, that was something to do um, with that kind of um, early form of Zionism uh, that had some moral energy. And whatever else one, I think one might say about Israel, I think that energy has dissipated. And for him, that return to Israel was a broken dream, uh, and something that really, I think, didn't work for him. And the British state, finally, obviously a much more complex, multifaceted, we'll hear all about this a little later on, uh, place. Uh, and it's difficult to characterise simply. And Stan, I think, was thinking about this a lot um, in his later years and in his early work. And uh, it reminded me of, um, you know, that old uh, rather pithy remark by Marx that the state is nothing else but the executive committee of the bourgeoisie to manage its common affairs. And I, I was trying to think, well, what would Stan have said, well, now? Well, perhaps at least part of it is the British state has now become the executive committee of the Daily Mail <laughs> to manage its, um, its vituperative campaigns against immigrants, welfare scroungers, 
um, uh, the leader of the opposition, and the liberal intelligentsia, the guardianistas, among whom I'm sure we have many represented tonight. So with that, I'll uh, happily give the floor over to our more professional colleagues. The Well, my brief is to talk about Stan as a criminologist. Um, and uh, what I found was that honoring Stan as a criminologist is uh, not as easy as it looks. For a start, he devoted quite some time to demolishing criminology, going so far as to call one of his major essay collections against criminology. He prefaced that book with a quote from Adorno, one must belong to a tradition to hate it properly. <laughs> Yet in 2009, he was happy to accept the British Society of Criminology's first ever award for outstanding achievement. This seeming inconsistency can be resolved by seeing criminology as a field he played a leading role in transforming and reshaping, even if certain old divisions still obtain. How did he accomplish this feat? Well, the first major step was the publication of Folk Devils and Moral Panics in 1972. It was based on his PhD thesis at LSE in 1969, which I, I just have to say was mainly supervised by Terence Morris. I took over just while, while Terry was in the States for a year. Um, it was entitled Hooligans, Vandals and the Community, a study of social reaction to juvenile delinquency, and it weighed in at 699 pages, or around 150,000 words, far longer than the limit, even then uh, laid down, but uh, nobody actually tried to insist on that limit uh, being respected in Stan's case, fortunately. The book, far shorter, distilled the growing body of largely American work on social reactions to deviance and applied it to the case of the mods and rockers, a brief period in British social history which saw rival youth groups clashing in several seaside towns in southern and eastern England, evoking responses from the police, courts and mass media which were excessive, punitive and melodramatic. As is now well known, he defined periods of moral panic as happening, quote, every now and then. A condition, episode, person or group become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians and other right-thinking people, unquote. Youth cultures lent themselves to recurrent waves of moral panic. Teddy boys, mods and rockers, skinheads, hippies, largely working class but less exclusively so in the wake of student revolt. <coughs> so formidable was Stan's contrast between the realities he observed at the scene and the images deployed by the courts and the media that the term moral panic entered the language attracted a usage far wider than youthful deviance and greatly influenced the politics of naming, social work and the multicultural debate. In his introduction to the third edition, 2002, Stan listed its extensive applications to youthful violence in schools, to drug use, child abuse, the media themselves when blamed for imitative violence, welfare cheats and scroungers, and immigrants and asylum seekers. The book, along with images of deviance a year earlier, a collection of essays by members of the recently formed National Deviancy Conference, which Stan edited and co-founded, 
set the scene for a criminology as much concerned with social reactions to deviance as with its causes, more so in some respects, as the reaction could amplify the deviance by distorted feedback, widening the gulf between deviance and mainstream society, and with the coda that ham-fisted controls can make things far worse. It was a unique achievement, which in key respects he shared with the late Jock Young, to synthesize the radical insights of American theorists of labeling and becoming deviant, Howard Becker and David Matzer in particular, with the statistical modeling of social deviance by Leslie Wilkins, and to apply it in detail to a specific social phenomenon. In the process, Stan took the lead with the NDC in challenging the dominance of positivism over criminology in Britain, an orthodoxy upheld by the Home Office, the Cambridge Institute of Criminology, and the medico-legal establishment. Following the natural science model, criminologists in this tradition sought to base the treatment of offenders on the biological, psychological, and social factors apparently differentiating criminal from non-criminal. The entire edifice of the criminal justice system, from policing through to prisons, was uncritically seen as neutrally responding, albeit unevenly, to deviance wherever it arose. Challenging this orthodoxy and replacing it with a sceptical view of crime, deviance and criminal justice, in which becoming deviant was analysed as a process hugely influenced by variables of class, power, race and gender, was far more realistic. However, the new criminologists that arose in the 1970s were in Stan's view all too flawed in their own right. Both the radical liberal non-interventionist approach, summed up in Ed Schur's phrase, leave the kids alone wherever possible, and the critical neo-Marxist approach, that youth subcultures are best decoded as forms of resistance to capitalist exploitation, were found wanting in his introduction to the second edition of Folk Devils in 1980. The first approach, in his view, amounted to little more than just doing nothing or benign neglect. The second approach suffered from an even greater dependence on sheer imputation than the earlier theories they criticised. Above all, I think, it was a swastika that did it for Stan. Having been adopted by some punks as part of their regalia, it was interpreted as symbolic irony a distancing from, not an affinity with, racism or Nazism. As with other subcultural symbols, this was basically presumed rather than shown to be the case. Stan's verdict was uncompromising to Dick Hebdige's assertion that, quote, one cannot verify an existential option scientifically, you either see it or you don't. He replied, well, in the swastika example, I don't. Such an inference may be, quote, an imaginative way of reading the style, but how can we be sure it is also not imaginary? His position was that of Samuel Beckett. No symbols were non intended. Stan's emergence as an utterly independent voice, whilst at the same time an advocate of a critical yet sceptical criminology, had been strengthened by his work with Laurie Taylor on long-term imprisonment. Their study, Psychological Survival, the experience of long-term imprisonment, was also published in 1972 as a kind of annus mirabilis, I think, for Stan, despite lacking formal permission from the Home Office, either for the research or for the book. They had access, but as teachers, not as researchers, to the Special Security Unit at Durham Prison, which held some of the most notorious prisoners in Britain. The result was a pioneering study, the first sociological study to focus on extreme long-term imprisonment in Britain, perhaps indeed the world. As the title suggests, the major preoccupation of those undergoing extreme long-term imprisonment came to be psychological survival. Could their core identity survive sentences of at least 10 and maybe 20 years or more? The prisoners evolved various techniques to sustain their sense of self, not just adapting to what Gresham Sykes had called the pains of imprisonment, 
but actively resisting them by such means as gaining expertise in law and other subjects, keeping ultra-fit, challenging authority by sit-ins, the occupation of officers, and in extremis, planning escapes, which in one dramatic case, John McVickers, actually succeeded. The Goffmanesque view that prisonisation or institutionalisation was bound to prevail was thus heavily qualified, if not rebutted. These were turbulent years for the prison service, and fears of escapes had led to two major reports by Mountbatten and Radzinovitz, with the Home Secretary choosing the latter's recommendation of dispersing the most serious risks around several maximum security prisons. Fears of escape were rife. Penal policy was becoming politicised. And Stan and Laurie's irreverent, if deeply serious, book caused consternation in the Home Office. A later, shorter work in 1976, Prison Secrets, anatomised the myriad ways in which prison rules attain a Kafkaesque character that worked to enmesh prisoners psychologically as well as physically. They argued that reform should take the form of rights rather than privileges or discretion. And it was as long in the future as the Wolf Report before that kind of agenda came to be taken on board. But was reform their main goal? Stan, in particular, was profoundly sceptical about reform for its frequent naivety and revolutionism for its lethal doublethink. He was drawn, rather, to Thomas Matheson's notion of the unfinished, a strategy for avoiding either reformism on the one hand, which is all too readily absorbed into the status quo, or revolutionism, which is at best regarded as ir irresponsible and therefore not taken seriously. In response to the standard put-down of academics by social workers, it's all right for you to talk, Stan recommended the uncertainty of staying unfinished in both theory and practice, in the hope that reformers could avoid system strengthening changes and work towards the abolition of penal and exclusionary practices. Quote, do not be ashamed of working for short-term humanitarian or libertarian goals, but always keep in mind the long-term political prospects. Unquote. To him, that meant avoiding the luxury of Freudian casework, much as he... Uh, highly regarded Freud's psychoanalysis and sophisticated class analysis, both of which, drawing on his own experience as a psychiatric social worker in the early 60s, could involve denying crucial material help to families in desperate need, on the one hand until casework had been completed, and on the other hand in the case of client refusal, actually dropping cases where the client objected to joining in the class struggle. This abolitionist position set the scene for Stan's next major contribution to the analysis of social control, the essay on the punitive city, published in Contemporary Crises in 1979, <coughs> and the kernel of his Visions of Control, truly major book, in 1985. <coughs> His celebrated fishing metaphors about trends in social control and justice are, along with moral panics, among the most cited in the literature. His concepts of net widening and mesh thinning, along with the blurring of the boundaries between criminal and non-criminal, and the penetration by the state into civil society, have proved astonishingly prescient. The catalyst was Foucault's Discipline and Punish, whose adoption of Bentham's model of the panopticon as the ideal prison, where one guard at the centre can keep a, an entire prison under, under surveillance by means of its uh, uh, circular design, <coughs> Sorry. was symbolically applied to society as a whole. Stan embraced and developed this deep structure to take in the host of community alternatives to prison, which in his view 
would extend penal disciplines and surveillance ever more widely and deeply. There have been some telling criticisms of this bleak pessimism. For example, Mae McMahon's argument that extensions to sentences of probation in Canada simply did not lead to increases in imprisonment, a point which still holds two decades later. There's also the wave of decriminalizations of the 1960s of homosexuality, of abortion law reform and of censorship, as well as the abolition of capital punishment. But these were all, again, in the abolitionist direction that Stan so favored. But these were followed by what he termed the new criminalizations attendant on reform movements to uphold, for example, in the USA in particular, victims' rights. And in other respects, the scales have tilted all too heavily in favour of Stan's visions. One only has to mention antisocial behaviour orders, ASBOs, uh, a second wave of which is now being flagged as incarnating all his metaphorical warnings. The war on drugs has proved massively counterproductive. The global reach of internet surveillance by NSA and GCHQ, exposed by Edward Snowden, the privatisation of prison management and industries, the immense increase in guard labour, especially private security, and the upsurge of mass imprisonment in America, all testify, along with the concepts of folk devils and moral panics, to his having left criminology far better equipped to explore and understand the world than was the case when he found it. His stature as an original and profound thinker is assured. Thank you. In his years in Israel, Stan challenged the boundaries between human rights activism and the campus. On the one hand, he insisted that the campus was a political space and that these attempts to keep the Israeli campus apolitical or neutral are really amounted to support for the occupying regime. On the other hand, he lent his academic knowledge and remarkable intellectual abilities to political and human rights activists who were fighting off the campus to end the occupation of the Palestinian territories. I vividly remember the first time I heard Stan speak at the Hebrew University Faculty Club in 1990. He was speaking about the human rights movement in Israel and South Africa. This was at the height of the Intifada, the first Intifada. Tens of thousands of Palestinians were being arrested, tortured, and imprisoned. From Mons Kaupus, where the campus was, one could hear the loudspeakers of the border police enforcing their curfew on the nearby village of Isawiya. One could smell the burning tires, yet the lecturers and the students went about their business as if everything was normal. It was as if there was no intifada happening just around us off the campus. That same year, in 1990, Stan had been a founding member of the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel. And a year earlier, we formed B'Tselem, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. We were despised as an enemy from within, and we were called traitors. Stan brought us to the forefront of academic discourse, comparing us to the human rights organization that were at the very same time celebrating the end of apartheid. In his brilliant academic lecture, he presented our human rights work as meaningful, overly restrained, and definitely worthy of, st of being studied and taught. I remember this lecture not only because it was exceptionally courageous, the first, and sadly, the last time I witnessed such a brave discussion on campus. But also, I remember hoping throughout the, lec the lecture that Stan was wrong. 
it was hard for me to hear about our self-censorship, our tendency to focus on individual rather than collective rights, and our non-political path as human rights organizations. And it was very hard to hear Stan's pessimist observation of the path we took. Back then, in 1990, I wanted to believe that if Israelis only knew what their army was doing to the Palestinians, if we could only document the human rights violation reliably, fairly, and clearly, if we could only get the information to the general public or to the policymakers, the occupation will surely end. At the time, I was also not aware of his pessimism. Stan's favorite Jewish joke was a recording on a Jewish answer phone that announces, at the sound of the beep, please leave your bad news. <laughs> or the Jewish telegram, start worrying, details to follow. <laughs> The world is full of what Saul Bello calls reality instructors, Stan wrote. People who tell you that everything is bad and getting worse. So wise up, get tough, buddy. The world is even worse than it seems. <laughs> Sadly, Stan was right then. As much as we tried, the military occupation had not ended, and the situation has just become worse. But Stan did much more than writing and talking. He also took action. During the Intifada, the Minister of Justice was the invited speaker at the Faculty of Law graduation ceremony. Stan wrote a personal letter to the students explaining why he, Stan, could not take part in the ceremony and why a minister responsible for human rights violations was not a worthy speaker. He went and passed out copies of the letter to each and every student in the crowd. His efforts to challenge perception of the campus as apolitical and bring the voices of human rights and equality to the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus were for the most part not very successful. For example, since 1988, for months and years, all the Palestinian universities in the occupied territories were closed under order from the military governor. And so were all the schools and the kindergartens. Stan and I tried to organize a two-hour solidarity strike of lectures at the Hebrew University. All we managed to achieve was support from 10 lecturers and a threat from the president of the university that those who participated would be fired. Stan later wrote about the campus. I quote, everything that makes up a normal university was in place at Mons Scopus. Students, courses, reading lists, libraries, departments, faculties, but every so often, I had the vaguely paranoid feeling that things were not quite right. I was relieved to find out that this was not my own autistic fantasies. Visitors and newcomers would also sometimes get the feeling that these were virtual universities, that they were on a Hollywood set and would wake up the next morning to find everything removed, the whole place empty. It felt like in a movie in which there was no occupation, no intifada, and the university was set in New Zealand. <laughs> Sadly, as Stan promised us, things got worse in recent years. Now organizations like Academic Monitor or Imtir Tzu are monitoring and recording classes and then demanding the dismissal of lecturers who express political opinions that are not in line with the Israeli consensus. Last month, I taught a class of graduate students Stan's book, States of Denial. And then we had a discussion. What is that we are denying, I asked them. They had many answers. Some talked about the meat that we are eating. Some talked about how we fear car accidents, but we don't really think about them. What about the occupation, I asked them, after a long time that the word occupation didn't come up. 
the occupation, they asked me. Some were not sure what is that I'm talking about. Others said, but the very word that you use when you say the occupation is a political statement. It doesn't belong here to the campus. And there was one who was particularly puzzled. And he asked, how can you use the term occupation? It implies that there is an occupier and an occupied. That's not the situation here. All of them agreed that it was the first time they ever heard this word on campus. Stan's unique contribution went beyond making the campus a site of discussion and subversion. He also brought academic knowledge off the campus to us activists who were struggling against the occupation. He gave the Israeli and Palestinian human rights movement a connection to academic knowledge that had not existed until then. His ability to illustrate, learn, and teach various theories gave our political activism, the human rights movement, a new depth, which gave, gave us confidence and taught us that there were other people at the world, in the world who were thinking like us, that there were other people who shared our beliefs that detention without trial is immoral, that torture is never justifiable, even if, according to Israeli law then, it was permitted to use moderate physical pressure, and that we could learn from other experiences of human rights organizations in other conflict zones. Stan and I wrote together the first report on torture of Palestinians in Israeli prisons. When we were writing during the first intifada, more than 100,000 Palestinians were detained and at least, despite our efforts to estimate low, over 80,000 of them subjected to the torture. We did our research and prepared the press conference and the publication of the report while the Gulf War began. We sat with our gas masks as siren blared outside. We didn't know then that Saddam Hussein didn't really have chemical weapons and that if he had chemical weapons, those masks would not help us anyway. <laughs> but we were very carefully asking ourselves, how could we explain to Israelis, as they're sitting now during the war in their sealed room, that it was not acceptable to torture Palestinians, even when the Israeli media was depicting Palestinians dancing on the roof, full of joy after every missile Saddam managed to land in Tel Aviv. Stan told us, between the sirens, about the importance of the struggle against torture in French discourse during the war of Algeria. He told us about the history of and the changing perceptions of pain and punishment. He insisted that the first report on torture in Israel meet the highest academic standards. I remember hours of discussions about how to present the security service interrogation methods and how to translate the stick figure depictions of the positions in which people were tied and tortured. There were people even at the board of B'Tselem at the time who asked us not to use the word torture. There were other people who asked us not to publish the report in English, but we insisted my confidence came from my absolute trust in Stan. The report had enormous media impact. Graphic drawings of standard tortured methods were widely reproduced. Two investigation commissions were formed to check our allegations. And a taboo subject was now discussed openly. Yet for some years, very little has changed. Stan tried to understand how is it that the information about torture has been received but not registered, and why it sank into consciousness without producing shifts in policy or public opinions. His work about how information about human rights violation is transmitted was not only theoretical, it helped us think through and change the ways in which we produced the reports. And it reminded us always to ask his question, 
What happens after the reports? Today, torture occurs less in Israel. It hasn't been eradicated. We didn't manage to have the interrogations videotaped or even recorded at all. But following our reports, following dozens of high court petitions, and finally the 1999 verdict prohibiting torture, the abuse and torture to which most Palestinian prisoners in Israel were subjected were increasingly monitored, documented, and performed under caution. Now they are more focused on the individuals rather than the vast majority of prisoners, as was previously the case. Next Sunday, we will hold a memorial for Stan in Jerusalem. His Israeli and Palestinian friends will meet to honor and remember him. So very rarely do we meet today Israelis and Palestinians. The policy of separation, it's the walls, the checkpoints, the separate roads. This policy has succeeded in tearing the peace and human rights community into small pieces. This policy was sowing seeds of despair between Israelis and Palestinians. We used to go together to Bethlehem to meet Palestinian lawyers and to Ramallah to meet our Palestinian friends in al haq The space and the political reality has changed dramatically, and encounters between Israelis and Palestinians have been almost entirely eradicated. Not much is left from the joint Israeli-Palestinian ventures for peace or from the, our joint Israeli-Palestinian human rights movement. We have a few small groups of Israeli anarchists and Palestinian villagers jointly opposing the wall. Some Palestinian and Israeli activists who still demonstrate in Sheikh Jarrah and a few friends who remain loyal to humanism and democracy without borders. The Israeli and Palestinian friends of Stan will meet once again to remember him, honor him, and thank him. For above all, Stan was a good friend, a wonderful, loyal, and good friend who's always there. If not in person anymore, then as a constant presence in our memories. He has always been with me, my compass. When I'm uncertain, angry, when I cannot believe that we cannot do more in the name of change, when it's hard for me to restore good, when I feel guilty and alone, I remember what Stan used to tell me. We do what we can. At least we bear witness. Trust your instincts and try to think what Stan would have thought or done. Stan was a person of both deeds and words. With his wisdom, his intellect, and his funny jokes, he paved the road for us, and he kept our optimism and our commitment to make the world a more just place. was asked to come to this event and say something about Stan's study, States of Denial, I, of course, started rereading the book, and I became moved because I, I heard him again. I heard his sharp intellect working. I heard his principled stubbornness. I heard his penetrating search for the honest answers. And when I put the book aside, I also heard his incredible Jewish jokes and his warm, wonderful laughter. 
he was a very deep friend. And he is, as Daphne has said, he's still with us with his messages. And I think the, the book, States of Denial, is very much Stan. It has so many different dimensions which are Stan. It is still highly relevant. It still, in my opinion, must be discussed. And the issues defined there must be brought forward. And I hope that this meeting will encourage us to take on the issues that he defined in this book and raise a meaningful discussion about going further. The book is about the response to the known facts about atrocities and suffering. It focuses on governmental authorities, but also, and their denials, but also something more complicated, namely how we as individuals, bystanders, develop modes of shielding ourselves from what we do not want to know. And one unique feature in this study is that Stan brings together those two dimensions in the same analysis. And this, of course, facilitates the exploration of the interrelationship between the official denials and our individual denials. The study gives examples on how nationalist populism promotes broad-based denials instigated or exploited by governments or nationalistic movements. One is example is a reaction to massive brutalities of the past, the recognition of which is seen as unpatriotic criticism of the nation itself. Discussing the collective and individual deni denials, Stan also refers to the strange understanding which developed in the communist countries between the rulers and the ruled, a phenomenon which Václav Havel described with the term living in a lie. Those who did not expose the lie were left untouched, others not. Urgent questions echo through Stan's text. Why do so few react to the reports on atrocities and suffering in the world? Do people not see? Or do they see but not care? Of course, these questions ring widely also today. Refugees and other migrants have been drowning in the Mediterranean for years. Have we not seen or have we not cared? Roma people in Europe have suffered systematic discrimination and rejection as long as we can remember. How can we explain the silence year after year on that? In most situations, in fact, the facts are available if we want to know. And knowing means an obligation to take position, to act, said Stan. To take action is to acknowledge that we have thought and understood the truth about atrocities and suffering. Stan was, of course, an outstanding thinker and scholar, but I believe that his study on denial would not have been as relevant had he also not been a human rights activist who, as Noam Chomsky once wrote, followed his course with courage, dedication and penetrating honesty. Indeed, Stan made sociology and criminology to the struggle, relevant to the struggle for human rights and vice versa. As Daphne just said, when it, Stan was in Israel, he became involved with Betzalem, this admirable human rights group, and contributed to the first report on torture of the Palestinian detainees. Though, as Daphne said, this report caused quite a lot of controversy for a while, Stan felt that the real response was one of step-by-step -step denial, which he summarized in four stages in the book. One, 
outright denial, two, discrediting, three, renaming, and four, justifications. Such methods of official denial are in fact typical also today, though of course there are some variations depending on the case itself. Outright denials tend to be the response from the most totalitarian states. Take for instance the government in North Korea. Other governments have great difficulties nowadays to deny the obvious facts when means of modern communication have exposed the problems to a wider audience. Discrediting the messenger or the source of information is nowadays extremely common. Those who report are accused of being biased, representing the opposition or even foreign agencies. Any factual mer uh, error, even the minor ones, are blown out of proportion and presented as a proof of bad faith, ignorance, and lack of seriousness. If um, government representatives fail to avoid a discussion, it's not unusual that renaming or using a trivializing language is practiced. With the response by the Bush administration, to the 9-11 terrorist attack, a number of creative expressions were invented to describe what torture methods would be approved during the enhanced interrogations. Stan's study reminds us about the term intensive interrogation used by the British security in Northern Ireland and the moderate physical pressure in the Israeli newspeak. When the facts about brutalities are particularly difficult to deny, the response is not seldom that these methods were in fact necessary, that there were no alternatives. Stan's book, as you know, was published 2001, the very year when the most systematic global justification campaign started with a clear element of fear-mongering. And I'm talking, of course, about the war on terror. After the 9-11 attacks, the Bush, Bush administration defined terrorist structures as a new global enemy, which had to be fought by warfare. The humanitarian law standards were deemed outdated and therefore nowadays irrelevant. Prisoner, prisoners could therefore be held without legal process and possibility to appeal. Likewise, the concept of torture was redefined and therefore torture was now permissible in the anti-terrorism war. Enemy combatants could be picked up in other countries or killed from the air. A global surveillance system was developed in cooperation with intelligent agencies in other countries. Terrorism became the perfect justification for Dick Cheney's new normalcy. The renaming and the justification campaign were combined with secrecy about some of the most ugly methods in this warfare, one being the existence of the so-called black holes, the secret CIA prisons where suspects were tortured during interrogation. The European Court of Human Rights has just finished its first hearing on one of these interrogation centers, the one in Poland. The U.S. authorities refuse any cooperation with these attempts to combat impunity. The Romanian government continues its denial of hosting a similar interrogation center in Bucharest. And there seem to be there seem to be two reasons for this. They do not want to go after the previous leaders in the country who approved the establishment of a CIA center, and they do not want to risk their relationship to Washington. And the Obama administration ignores the appeals from human rights activists in Europe to allow the truth to come out. So we are faced here with a conspiracy of silence which establishes impunity for the crime of torture. It would be interesting to have Stan's comment and analysis of these developments. Another area where I 
misstands analysis is the development when it comes to the new social media and its consequences. Of course, the social media have served the interest of spreading facts about, among other things, human rights violations, yes. Of course, also the new social media have helped in organizing, mobilizing people to protests and demonstrations that may be useful in the struggle for human rights. But these media being political neutral, they have also served the right-wing groups in their hate campaigns. The mass killings in Oslo and Utøya in July 2011 was conducted by a man who had for a long time fed himself with distorted sick messages on extremist websites and blogs all over the world. In Norway, he was isolated, but on the global net, he had found friends with whom he developed his pervert Weltschan Anschau. He was hid hidden in that world. He was disconnected from any communication which would have provided questions and alternative views. This man made a choice, and after that, no reason could reach him. And I believe there is, this is a lesson. There is a lesson in this which we have to, to consider, not least in view of the demise of the traditional media in our societies. Presentations of history are also full of examples of denials and distortions. Stan's rebuttal of the arguments by the Holocaust deniers is crystal clear and worth reading. At the same time, when you read, you sense that Stan was sad that he had to take that debate at all. An unfortunate combination of politicization and denial has undermined the work to establish a true narrative of past atrocities in, for instance, in relation to the mass killing of Armenians in what later became Turkey from uh, one, uh, 1915 onwards, and also when it comes to uh, the man-made disastrous famine in Ukraine in the 1930s. Stan also analyzes uh, the experience we have so far when it comes to truth commissions and criminal tribunals. Of course, it's not, not difficult to point at flaws in the conduct of these initiatives so far. The approaches have been selective and based on the political possibilities when it comes to deciding what should be studied. The procedures have in some sometimes got off the ground but have been um, undermined by the lack of resources and good management. Mm -hmm. The International Criminal Court has faced outright obstruction, not least from the United States. In other words, there hasn't been a strong political will to develop a gro global criminal justice system, even when it comes to the most horrible human rights violations. The dilemma of a possible conflict between establishing justice and promoting peace has, of course, been discussed and is also discussed in Stan's study. Too often, justice has been sacrificed in the search for peace agreements, which in some cases have contributed to making a peace which had been fragile in the longer term. Maybe we have to admit that there are, in fact, situations when there is a genuine conflict between the two interests, justice and organizing peace, and that this uh, make it necessary, in some cases, to postpone the criminal procedures for some time. However, our experience is that justice must sooner or later be made in order for peace to be sustainable and no bad example set for the future. Stan in his study pays tribute to the anti-denial movement, as he says. He mentions the mother of Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, women in black in Israel, black sash in South Africa. Of course, such groups have acted as a moral conscience in their societies, and they have had some impact, no doubt. Organizations like Memorial in Russia 
have taken on a broader mandate and been immensely important, in fact, to highlight crimes in the past and also to respond to current violations. And in the Balkans, in the Balkan countries, a number of human rights organizations have run an important campaign, they have called it RECOM, to get a deeper accounting of the past violations there, including to establish a true narrative, to bring culprits to trial, to continue the work on the disappearances, including opening the mass graves, which still remain to be opened, and to ensure compensation to the victims. Their work, I think, is in the spirit of what Stan wanted to happen. Organised, non-governmental, voluntary work for human rights is what Stein, St- Stan describes as our hope. And he quotes a statement by Arthur Miller on Amnesty International, a statement which is actually relevant for the whole international human rights movement. Miller said that his work, with its daily stream of documents from all over the world, is a daily, weekly, monthly assault on denial. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank very much um, uh, Margo and uh, Judith and her family for um, uh, carrying on uh, and organizing this event. Um, After uh, hearing uh, these uh, remarkable comments about Stan, um, uh, it um, uh, it made me um, uh, actually think about uh, uh, it's remarkable he would have me as a friend. and I think that uh, he would, uh, and he did. Um, and that's uh, because he wore all of this that's been described very lightly. It was um, a non judgmental human being um, making these great judgments um, and, uh, and, acting, uh, and acting on them. Um, in uh, p- calling upon, uh, inviting me to this uh, meeting, um, the straw I drew was Stan as the uh, scholar of social control. And um, at- immediately I was uh, um, not seized, but um, concerned that, my God, I haven't really read Stan's major book, Visions of Social Control. And so I'd better get right on that. Um, and I pulled it off the shelf, and uh, dust was flying. The book was published in 1985. My, mine was inscribed in 1986. Um, and I started reading this uh, remarkable, wonderful book. I um, agreed with um, everything uh, pretty much in it, um, including the many, many comments I'd inscribed in the margins, uh, because um, in the, it, that was something else I did not remember. Uh, that I had um, read the book. Um, and as Margot said, and, and I can prove it, I have it with all of its comments and its cracked back, um, it, it very much influenced me. Um, and um, so if I fail to acknowledge it, it's because I honestly um, failed to remember uh, that uh, its content had become part of me. And I think that's uh, the, the, the case in general with Stan's work, which is that those who have had uh, contact with it, it becomes part of them. So it's not Cohen 1985. It's just uh, the way the world is. Um, and it's something we, um, that, we take, uh, that we take on board. Um, so uh, Stan was this remarkable combination of an active and forthright um, person, um, brave, courageous, and bold. Um, but that happened um, in a personality uh, that is not our stereotypical sense um, of what a man on horseback in the park uh, would be like. Um, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't like that. Um, he instead, um, with all of that which was going on and all the work so learned as I once again uh, came across in this book, 
um, careful, covering a vast amount of terrain, and yet also looking for ways in which uh, ways in which um, there was more to be said, uh, not only by the people who said them, but how to make sense of it. Um, in this book, Visions of Social Control, he takes on the whole history, beginning in the mid-19th century, of all the ways uh, that authorities uh, and publics have thought about um, and um, figured, tried to figure out how to handle the outliers, how to deal with trouble, how to isolate people, how to absorb them uh, when they were seen to be needing to be brought in line, how to take care of all of that. Um, and uh, he concludes in watching these um, comings and goings, comings from the left, comings from the right, the initial establishment of asylums, the wardens and what they were up to, and the social workers, what they came to be up to. What he thinks about all of them, and he says it quite explicitly, is that probably in the great majority of cases, they were thought that they were doing good doing good despite the ill effects, uh, the servicing of nefarious masters of different kinds. In fact, uh, what they were doing was doing good. They were, in fact, ideologists, whether they realized it or not. And so Stan says what ideology is, and here he defines it. It's persuasive ability to keep us believing that we are doing one thing while we might really be doing something else. So he ascribes that to the wardens and the people who he came to critically analyze. But in a certain way, I think he's flagging it as true of everyone, or at least as something to be concerned about. And David mentioned that his, um, his, his concerns were not only about the, the right um, and the, the forces of, that we ordinarily associate with repression, but also um, the misfirings and hazards that come from the left um, as it has approached these issues. As he puts it in this book, the price we sometimes pay for political awareness, that there are mishaps that go on and take place there as well. Given that this book is filled with relativistic notions, concerns of characteristically stand on the one hand this, while on the other hand that, how does he manage to come down with something? And the kind of um, hard thinking that Stan does is reflected in the, all this work and all the things that we've talked about. And so he concludes um, on some simple, with some simple observations that the reason to have playgrounds for children is not because it might help ease the problem of juvenile delinquency. Uh, it is right to have playgrounds for children because children enjoy playgrounds. And if we just guided our behavior in that way toward the direct doing of good and providing pleasures for other human beings, then we wouldn't need to have so many clinching arguments so many sophisticated data sets um, in order to uh, make decent um, things that are in the world. Um, so uh, one of his other takeaways is, in a way, credit them all, um, including the people who, in um, his historical origins, South Africa, um, his sojourn in Israel. Uh, by the way, um, and Stan was a man of ambivalence, I just want to mention. And being with him in these different places in the world, um, Stan um, uh, uh, and Robin brought this up in, in, in his way. Um, he, he belongs in Israel, Stan would say. Uh, no, no, I belong in Britain, Stan would say. Uh, I, I belong in California, uh, Stan would also say. And he would have very good arguments uh, for them all and very good anxieties uh, that went, in fact, um, to, uh, for all of them. 
He credited other human beings, including those who had positions that were opposite of his. He credited them, credited them with, um, in their way, having a vision of doing good. He didn't do this, I don't consider this nice. He didn't do it to be nice, and I don't think it was nice, or to be humane. It, wasn't, it did not come out of a play, playbook of a way to, be if, to see if they were humane. Uh, instead, he did it because he was trying to see if maybe they were correct. He had a kind of courage, not just um, in the ways that people have talked about, um, um, to be on the, on the firing line. He had the courage to think that maybe the people he was opposing were right. He would try that on, I think, as at least a thought experiment. Um, he had a kind of loyal nag always in his mind, the nag that maybe what he was thinking was wrong and maybe his opponents were, in fact, right. As he says in this book, he says that um, we should not take our opponents at face value um, and their uh, statements of why they had to make these compromises at face value. But we needed to find the face behind that face value. We needed to find and discover the face that created that face value, uh, that reality behind their vision of social control, what in fact is their location in the social system, such that they would come up with the things they came up with. We would not only test our own ideas against those historic facts of their own being, but we would also be in a better position to oppose them if we actually understood them in that kind of way. So Stan's commitments, which we've heard a lot about today, came out of a very hard-headed and subtle anxiety. He knew too much to enjoy life to its fullest. Instead, uh, or enjoy it simply, he knew too much. Ironies were his fun. Uh, wicked ironies, subversive ironies, fierce ironies. When he came upon those ironies and truly appreciated them, often t made part of his jokes, when he truly appreciated them, I think for him that was the test of truth, that that was his e the equivalent of a, a chemical acid test, a statistical test of significance, if he ended up with this kind of fierce irony that the truth had finally been found. Thank you all so much for all the wonderful things you said about Stan and for capturing him in his many dimensions so, so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm, I'm now going to ask a few of uh, Stan's friends and colleagues um, to contribute a few words from the floor before I open the floor to everyone. And so it's rather good because I can see you're all sitting more or less close to each other. So if you could remember to um, get the microphone um, before speaking. So uh, Bruna and uh, Bruna and Amanda and Ron and Lynn and Claire, maybe you could also um, say introduce yourselves and speak about your connection with Stan. Sure. Thanks. Um, I'm Bruna Seu, and um, I met Stan in 1997. At that time, I was carrying out a pilot study for a project exploring people's responses to information about human rights violations, in particular, how they explained and justified their passivity. Stan's article on denial in Israel had just appeared in Index on Censorship. And his concept of denial was exactly what I needed and had been looking for. 
So I rang LSE, and to my amazement, Stan picked up the phone. At that time, Stan was dividing his time between London and Israel, and when I rang, he was about to return to Jerusalem. Had I waited to make the phone call, I would have missed him, and many things would be different in my life. I explained why I was ringing, and in typical Stan fashion, he offered me an appointment the same week. Soon after that, we started to meet regularly at Café de Lancy in Camden Town to discuss denial. <laughs> it was a designated denial spot. Stan was working on states of denial at that point, and luckily for me, because of my psychoanalytic training, he wanted to bounce off ideas about the psychoanalytic understanding of denial. So began a lasting and immensely rewarding collaboration which went over the years from his insights and suggestions on my project on human rights through some writing we did together on denial and since 2010 to his role as a consultant on a three-year project funded by the Liverham Trust, which I lead in collaboration with Shani Orgad. The three of us worked on the proposal for 18 months and it took us forever to find the title. <laughs> We finally settled on an incredibly convoluted title, but luckily when we got the funding, we realized that part of the title, which was Knowledge, Audiences, Responses, and Moral Action, spelled the acronym KARMA. <laughs> this generated endless riffs on the KARMA theme. So for example, if the team met a stance place, it would say, welcome to KARMA stand. <laughs> That turned out to be the last project Stan worked on. In parallel to the working relationship, an invaluable friendship also developed between us, which led me to meet Ruth and their two beloved children, Jude and Jess, and their families. I'm grateful for the times we shared together and the many good memories. It is virtually impossible to summarize a man of such complexity and depth as Stan. Much is known and has already been said about his intellect. There is no doubt that he had an exceptional mind, but this is not, in my view, what made him so extraordinary. For me, it was how his intellect was always linked to and integrated with a very big and compassionate heart. His ethics were not, as it is sometimes the case, of a purely cerebral nature or abstract concepts disconnected from his daily life. On the contrary, his deeply felt sense of justice, fairness, and compassion drove all his actions. Despite his international fame, there was nothing aggrandized about Stan. He always remained modest and approachable, and immensely generous with his time and care, despite the mounting difficulties caused by his illness. <laughs> Above all, Stan was human, through and through. From his contagious delight in jokes, and passionate aversion to raw onions, <laughs> to his intolerance for trendy phrases like cutting edge, which he hated. <laughs> he used to say that he never understood why people are so obsessed with being loved when for him loving took priority. Events like today's are a testimony of how much he did love and how many lives he's touched. Hi, my name is Amanda Goodall, um, and I used to work at the LSC. Um, I'm one of uh, I'm a jokes junkie of stands, in fact. And uh, last night, um, Andrew and I went through loads of the jokes, and we had a real, a really good chorter. And I was thinking maybe I should tell one of the jokes. And I thought, went through my thought, no, I can't tell a Jewish joke, and his Gentile jokes were not really as good. So I decided <laughs> to, I wouldn't do the jokes. But he and I met in 1997. Um, early in 1998, we had our first meeting about the Human Rights Centre, in fact, um, and it was an extremely exciting time. Um, we discussed, he was very much leading on it, um, he wanted the Human Rights Centre to be multidisciplinary, that was very important to in incorporate all of LSE's disciplines. He, uh, at the time, most of them were, uh, were based around law. He also wanted it, obviously, it had to be intellectually very rigorous and um, had to be relevant to human rights activists in the field. He brought Margot in very, very early on, and um, Tony Giddens, who I was working with at the time, was very, very supportive of this, and a number of other people involved early on, Sharon Trelev, 
and uh, Fred Halliday, who's not here, and Christine, who's here, and many others who are, are in the room. And it was an amazing time, and it was such an amazing thing to get off the ground. And I was very, very, very happy to be involved in that and to work with Stan on that. Just finally, um, a number of years ago, I wrote a paper uh, on, in, about uh, climate change, about the, the lack of exposure of climate change, in fact, in many of the top academic journals. And, of course, it made me think immediately about Stan's work on cultural denial. And he and I talked about that a lot, and he's had a lot of, a lot of involvement by the, the, the uh, environmental activists and, and academics who've been in touch with him, um, because, of course, cultural denial is just so relevant to, to climate change. But, no, I miss him very, very much, and I really miss his jokes as well. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Ron Duday, uh, now back in Jerusalem. Uh, I was a student of Stan here at the LSE uh, 12 years ago, I think, and remain a student of Stan uh, forever since, in a way. And um, I think I probably wasn't as personally close to Stan as some of the other speakers here, but. Uh, there's something very strong and special and wonderful about the, the teacher-student relationship and uh, I feel very lucky to, to have had Stan as, as my teacher and to still have him in a way. And in that sense, I'm not in any way unique. I think there are dozens and hundreds walking among us who, uh, who are Stan students who, for them, it's still a lasting aspect of their identity to be, to be Stan student. And I think there's something um, very strong about it. Um, I remember the first time I visited uh, Stan's flat, I was doing some research uh, assistant uh, gig at the time for him, and I entered this study, and you know, you're kind of very nosy to see how the study of the famous professor would look like. And, I remember there were the four posters of uh, Bob Dylan, Che Guevara, Samuel Beckett, and the Giants of Jazz. I was thinking, and even just, I mean, it goes back to some of the things that David and Daphna and others were talking about. Just having Che Guevara and Samuel Beckett looking at you, the revolution and the waiting for Godot, I mean, this, this in itself was, was a strong message. But we, we started chatting over the Giants of Jazz photograph with, with Thelonious Monk, the great jazz pianist. Uh, at its center, and, and I discovered another great thing about Stan, which he, which he liked jazz, and chatted a bit about Thelonious Monk. And Thelonious Monk was also known as, as a great and peculiar teacher of, of young musicians. Um, for example, he would never give them the music, never give them the notes. He would just say, the music is inside you, look what I'm doing, try to do something similar. And there's one, uh, there's one episode about Monk in which um, at one time he got a bit angry with one, one, of, his, uh, one of his players in a, in a rehearsal and he told him, stop it, you're making the wrong mistakes. <laughs> and I think that's a great teaching moment, this idea that we're going to make mistakes anyway, but they are right mistakes and wrong mistakes. <laughs> And the wrong mistakes are about being lazy, about being arrogant, about being funny. And Stan was this kind of a teacher who will let you do whatever you want, but he will, he will hear the sound when, when you're being a bit lazy, a bit arrogant, a bit funny, and he will always check you there. And if you didn't, you can always go back and, and, and read, read his, uh, his writing and see how someone can write so deeply, so funny, without never being lazy or arrogant or funny. And for me, and again, I think for, for many, 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 many of us, uh, for me, when, when, when I write now, when I lecture now, I, I always have this kind of ritual of kind of thinking to my, reading it and thinking, what would Stan say? Would Stan find a, a wrong mistake here? And I think it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to have, to have, uh, to have someone who touched so many, so many people's life in that way. Lynn Welshman from SAAS, a bit of diversity in the university. Um, and I met Stan in the 90s. I was working with the Palestinian Human Rights Movement. Um, at the time, I was working with a small organization. I just left Al Haq with one of Al Haq's founders, Charles Shemes, who was at LSE recently. I think some of you might have been there. And we called the new organization 
uh, very small, it was only about three of us, the Centre for International Human Rights Enforcement. And I think Stan had some kind of admiration for our boundless aspirations, obviously, at this tiny little thing. Or, looking back, given what he wrote later, he knew what we hadn't yet realised in terms of the odds we were up against. Um, although he didn't give up, and Charles certainly never gave up. So that meeting took place in Charles's house, Charles and Maha's house in, in, in Beit Hanian in East Jerusalem. Um, and I got to know Stan much better when I was working with Margot and Stan and Thomas. I was very honoured to be the interim coordinator of the International Council on Human Rights Policy, which I said very quickly, the International Council on Human Rights Policy. I'm sorry. We used to have to say it quite quickly. Because it was also quite a small organisation with a very long name, as I remember. Yes. Um, although it got bigger. Um, and he was an extraordinary um, colleague in that. As I said, I was the sort of... Um, interim help, if you like, the coordinator. I learned a lot. When I went to SOAS, what I want to come to, is after a while at SOAS, and, and Stan and Ruth became friends when I was in London, and they were in London, and I started something called the International Human Rights Clinic, which is what I want to get to, because it was a sort of teaching that Stan was very supportive of, as in fact has Ron been. Um, and Stan used to come once a year, despite his declining health as the years went on, went on to give a talk to the students in my international rights clinic about the denial, it's about states of denial. And it was absolutely mesmerising. I mean, he, I know a lot of the students here would know that, but I'd never been Stan's student, sort of, in his class. And I, obviously, would also be mesmerised. And he had this uh, way of starting, slow start. No, yeah, everybody here knows it, but he's an absolutely stunning teacher, and I agree with everything everybody said on that. And also an extraordinary level of generosity and follow-up. So he was never too busy, even though they weren't his students, quote-unquote, of course they all became his students, in one way or another, um, to follow up with them, even though, as I said, they, weren't, they w went way beyond the classroom. And he was entirely inspiring, although entirely sombre. So there was this idea that you can be sombre about the subject and at the same time not hopeless, clearly. Um, the one thing I wanted to remember, that I remember, is that extraordinary gaze he had, um, intellectual and physical, those you know, big eyes and this gaze, this very piercing, fierce gaze, both physical. You know, and you think those things, times, things happen, especially now, when things are getting quite, they seem to be getting more surreal than they used to be then. And you get these things that happen, you, you want to take them to stand, like a little, you know, get, and say, look at this, did you hear this? So that he sort of throw his arms open, his hands open, and say, yeah, with glee, you know, because he'd get this one more, <laughs> and his eyes would go, and the hands would go, and he'd start talking about the ironies, I think that's what it is. And that's... Um, I guess we all miss him, and we always will miss him. So, thank you. Um, I'm Claire Moon from the Sociology Department at the LSE, the Centre for the Study of Human Rights. I first met Stan about ten years ago at a seminar on transitional justice, um, and we chatted afterwards. He suggested I apply for a job that was going in the sociology department, the Human Rights Centre. Um, I applied. I'm still here. Um, but it's hard to imagine that um, when I first met Stan, I didn't know who on earth he was. I'm slightly embarrassed to admit that in front of um, this audience, but it is true. Um, and I'd been schooled in other disciplines, and I hadn't really encountered his work at that point. Um, but he went on to become a mentor, a friend, and a true inspiration for my own work. Um, we had many really enjoyable classes, teaching together, teaching groups of students together on the human rights program. He always managed to squeeze in the odd genocide joke. Um, this absolutely terrified me. <laughs> it was something I never would have dared to do, nor could I claim the, the, the privilege to, to do that. Um, he, of course, got away with it. Um, he was always also regaling students with um, Rumsfeld's theory of knowledge, um, the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and so on. Um, I should mention um, that Christine was actually a very important um, person in um, his teaching life here at the LSE because Christine and Stan um, were really the parents of the MSc in Human Rights um, and their teaching together, their particular style that they developed was really inimitable um, and I know that um, he really valued the time that he spent um, teaching with, with Christine and that co-teaching model was really um, dynamic and special and I know the students really appreciated that. Um, students were absolutely enchanted and compelled by him, and it remains the case that um, they're inspired and deeply provoked by his work. So I went um, really from not knowing who Stan was um, 
to some years later really finding him all over the topics that I teach, um, the, the, the stuff that I write about. Um, he's been a massive inspiration to me. Um, I've just returned um, from um, a weekend giving a lecture um, in his memory at the University of Athens. And um, this was a day conference on moral panics and denial. It was no surprise, really, to find the idea of um, moral panic um, deeply etched in the Greek criminological imagination. Um, but it was the concept of denial, really, that was um, most um, exercising the conference participants, um, both in relationship to contemporary um, social issues in Greece, especially in relationship to immigration. Um, but also in relationship to Greece's transition from military rule in the 1970s. Um, this was, um, as people who, who work in the field know, a transition without um, transitional justice in the contemporary sense. It was a case really alongside um, uh, the cases of Spain and Portugal, um, to which both Stan and I regularly um, referred in our teaching. Um, there's no question in my mind that Stan has bequeathed a really distinctive and provocative legacy for human rights academics and activists to take up. I just hope we can do that legacy the justice it deserves. It's a really tall order. Thank you all so much. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't got time. Um, that's the terrible thing about being chair. You have to be very strict. And we've still got one last part of our program. Um, so if you could stay seated. Um, uh, our speakers will now go down to the floor. And I, I hope that you, I'm sure that you would wish to join me in thanking them. And I also um, do want to uh, thank uh, especially uh, Zoe Gillard because she's worked so hard to make this evening a success. And I don't know if you realize it, Zoe, but Stan was always very appreciative of all the help um, and support you gave him. So a big thank you to you. So it's also asked me to inform you um, that, uh, that LSE's Human Rights Library now uh, contains the Stan Cohen collection. These are books, reports, and journals um, that belong to Stan um, that his family um, have entrusted to the centre uh, for the use of, 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 of students present and future and outside researchers and so on. You can find um, the online links to the online catalogue um, and information about visiting the library on the LSE um, Human Rights Centre's website. And you can also find on the website um, the full tributes to to Stan, you, you have in your programs there, have, there was there's some brief extracts of tributes to Stan. You can find the full tributes on the website, along with many many others that have been made. So I, I do encourage those of you who don't know about it to go there. Um, now we're reaching the very end of our evening, and. Um, Opera uh, was one of Stan's greatest passions, and uh, Italian opera um, he, I, he loved a lot, perhaps more than others, I'm not quite sure. Jude may know better than me. Um, a film that he loved watching, he watched it time and again, and he recommended it to his friends, was a, a documentary film called... Uh, Il Bacio di Tosca, uh, Tosca's Kiss. And it, it is indeed a, a really heartwarming documentary about um, retired opera singers and musicians who are um, residents of a retirement home in Milan uh, that was uh, founded by Verdi. And we're really... Uh, very, very fortunate this evening to have with us 
um, Gwyneth Ann Jeffers and Alison Deverson, who will be performing for us um, an aria from, from Tosca. Um, Gwyneth is a, uh, I have to get this title right, is a former young artist of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden and her international operatic roles have included Aida, Tosca and, uh, and uh, Leon Leonora um, from um, La Forza del Destino. And Alison is music director with Nitro Music Theatre. And she was also the creative and directive force behind uh, the a cappella choir, uh, Nitrovox. So we're imm immensely grateful to you both for, for being here this evening and for participating in this tribute. Um, I want to end by thanking you all um, for coming tonight and um, to tell you that we'd be delighted if you'd join us at the reception, um, which will be after uh, this, um, uh, this evening's event. And it's in the Shaw Library, which is in the, on the sixth floor, and stewards outside will, will guide you to, to it. It's a little bit tricky to find, but Zoe assures me that, that there will be people on the way, um, so you won't get lost. Um, so uh, our evening will end um, with Gwen, Gwyneth and Alison performing uh, Visi d'Arte from Puccini's uh, Tosca. <laughs>